Hello everyone, Hello. I'm Nick Buckley, I'm a sports reporter for the Battle Creek Inquirer, and thank you for coming to the Mosaic Storytelling Showcase. So tonight's theme is about fear. So uh, we all know fear comes in many forms. Uh, for me personally, I have to face my biggest fear every single day. Uh, it's uh, an irrational fear, uh, which means it's a phobia. It's called scurryphobia. Does anybody here know what scurryophobia is? Fear of, any guesses, no? Fear of squirrels. <laughs> That's about the response I expected. Uh, so, <laughs> so, I don't know where it came from. Uh, I've never been attacked by a squirrel. Uh, when I tell people I'm afraid of squirrels, they always love to tell me their squirrel stories. So, if you have them, keep them to yourself. I don't want to hear them. Uh, so, it might come from when I was a kid. I grew up here on the north side of Battle Creek, actually just down the road here, Capitol Avenue. And uh, my stepdad worked for Hostess. So, our garage was always chock full of uh, Hostess goodies and treats. So I'd come home from uh, school, and I'd open up our garage, and staring back at me would be two black squirrels eating Twinkies. <laughs> so, <laughs> my, I, I kind of freeze up when I see squirrels. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm in public, uh, it just kind of stops me in my tracks. And uh, my only line of defense, if they get too close, is to go <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't work. I don't know why I do it. It's never worked. Uh, people say, well, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. Well, maybe everyone else. Because they must smell it on me. Like, they know I'm afraid. Uh, they get pretty close. Uh, so, I mean, the thing about black squirrels, too, I mean, uh, Battle Creek kind of has a unique history with black squirrels. And, and I don't know if anybody else has heard this, this legend. Uh, I haven't verified it, but uh, the, one of the Kellogg brothers, I guess, imported squirrels down from Canada into Battle Creek. Well, here on the north side, uh, they had no competition, no predators, so they just really thrived. I mean, it, it, I'm sure some of you even driving in today saw some black squirrels out on the street. Uh, so you can't really get away from them. Uh, and the squirrels have been a, a source of great humor for my family and friends. Uh, not so much me over the years. Uh, sometimes uh, my little daughter or my nieces and nephews love the, the, the good joke is, uh, knock knock, who's there? Squirrel, squirrel who, squirrel you. <laughs> and that's hilarious, I guess. Yeah. So, <laughs> over the years, kind of, uh, I mean, uh, I had some roommates in college that bought a fake squirrel, and I was napping on the couch one day, and they put it right next to my face, hoping I'd wake up. It wasn't a very good plan, because, I mean, I might be scared of squirrels, but I can tell a fake one from a real one. <laughs> Uh, but anytime there's a squirrel on the news or, you know, a squirrel on the field for a sporting event or uh, anything like that, I get texts, I get Facebook messages, people love sending me pictures of squirrels, and I hate it. I hate all squirrels, uh, specifically the black squirrels of Battle Creek, though. Uh, they're pretty unique and just unlike regular squirrels, you think of woodland squirrels, you know, cute, uh, munching on an acorn in a tree. Not Battle Creek squirrels. These squirrels will dig through your garbage. Uh, they will go through your stuff, and I've seen them dragging pizza boxes across the yard. <laughs> so, you know what they're capable of. So, I think thinking about that this week, and, and knew, uh, knowing I was going to come here and talk about fear, I actually had this dream. Uh, was, I swear to God, I had this dream. So, I was walking into a circus tent, because dreams, you know, don't make any sense. Uh, and a squirrel starts climbing up my leg. So, and that's just terrifying me. And what do you do in that situation? You can't really punch a squirrel, and the thought of grabbing it by the tail is not going to happen for me. Uh, so, in my dream, I got down on all fours, and the squirrel gets on my back. 
And at that point, I'm thinking, okay, somebody will maybe grab it, kick it, throw it, but just a circle of people around me pointing and laughing. So my misery was their joy, and that kind of sums up uh, the way I feel about squirrels. Uh, it's just, I'm glad it brings so much joy to everyone else that I'm terrified of them, but it's a very real phobia. So uh, that's all I got for uh, squirrels, but uh, um, I, I, we have a great lineup of storytellers tonight, uh, and if you could all please be courteous and respectful and turn your phones off and give them your undivided attention. Uh, and uh, please continue to support local journalism. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand the phone off to tonight's MC, Sean Washington. Oh, yeah. I am way too cool for that. Way too cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I just want to know, um, first and foremost, during the, the preamble, I was just picking on people because it's very dangerous to give someone as adventurous as I a microphone and not give them some very specific instructions on what they can and cannot do. Uh, so if you want to harass the people that I mentioned earlier, I welcome you to. They will hate me forever. Um, so tonight, we are doing fear. I thought, because fear is one of those things that, has, it's one of the top fears of, excuse me, being in public, public speaking. It's one of those fears that so many people experience. What I thought would be nice is if we could have everyone go ahead and join our tellers up here, and that way they wouldn't feel alone, and they'd be able to become more of a, you know, just kind of a casual environment. Um, I, I asked for that, and, and then, Michelle Frank, who is our organizer, recruiter, our everything, and also our resident adult, um, <laughs> told me that I couldn't do that. And I was like, man, I don't really want to. And she said, no. And so I said, OK. And I really want to call her the fun thief, because she stole my fun that time. But to be God's honest, there's very few people, if anyone, that does more in the community, more in the city of Battle Creek, to encourage interesting things and fun the Michelle. She is amazing at that. I know she's trying to hide not being here, but can we give her a real quick round of applause? And she's taking me also right now. I said her name. She has to come. <laughs> She's so humble, I love her to death. So, fear. Um, f when we first came up with this, I started thinking, like, wow, am I, like, the Crypt Keeper? Like, setting these people up in this position where they're, like, you know, have, dealing with the worst possible situation, and we are here musing at their horrible moment. And I started feeling bad about that, and then... I stopped because they kind of did this to themselves. They, they had every opportunity not to do this. They were part of the, we had tons of people that showed up for the workshops, and of those, 10 people decided that they were gonna dig deep and find some story that matched up with the topic and actually was something that they felt strongly enough about to truly just come out and tell. These 10 instant special people came out and they walked into a room that looked a lot like American Idol with like some very, very stern looking judges staring at them and they told their story and they waited and waited, hoping that they would get that golden ticket. And the 10 tellers that you see coming on the stage tonight got their golden ticket. This is their opportunity to share their story and to actually be on the stage and share part of who they are with all of you. As you know, storytelling is a little different than many art forms. It, it, it's not just about the teller, but you all have a special part, and it's this too. You have to do your part. The listener is just as important as the teller. And so as we go through, I want you to remember that this isn't like other art forms where you have a dynamite line or there's a musical accompaniment. This is something that is told person to person, heart to heart. This is a special moment between you and each of these tellers that may be recorded, but it'll never be reproduced. And that's what makes this gift so special. So to honor that, I just want you guys to take a moment, if you'd be so kind, as to make sure your phones are on mute or vibrate or off. Um, this moment is amazing, and I don't want you to miss any part of it or be distracted by anything that might be happening. 
Uh, I would also um, ask you to do me one quick favor before we get started. If you have taken this stage before, if you have been a mosaic storyteller or a storyteller this year, can I get you just to stand up real quick? in the front row and think I was going to miss you, really, a uh, nice try. Uh, hey, and just for, just for giggles, if you have come to a Mosaic Storytelling before, can I get you to stand up? Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, this would not happen without all of you. We appreciate you so, so much. So with that, I have done my part of this where I talk and now I get to get off the stage and that makes me kind of happy. The first teller that we're bringing up, Dick Strader is, he has been here, he has been a mentor, he has been so much to each and every one of us. When I first started this, I was thinking that, you know, when someone tells you a good story, it feels like you're getting to know him a little better. What Dick taught me is, when someone tells you a great story, you feel like you've known him for a lifetime. I, this guy is amazing to me. I, I don't know what my life was like before. It will never be the same after coming to the stage. We have Dick Strader. As a storyteller, one of my favorite places to tell stories is elementary schools. Several years ago, when we went down to Bridgewater, Virginia to see our daughter and her family, my grandson, Andrew, who was in second grade at that point, said, Grandpa, can you come and tell stories at my school? And I said, sure, but you'll need to talk to your teacher first. And that very evening, I got a call from Andrew's teacher inviting me to come and tell stories. I went, and we had a wonderful time together. <coughs> I told several Anansi tales. I told a couple Jack tales. And then I told Andrew's favorite story of all time, Dragon's Eyes. It's a Chinese folk tale, kind of spooky, where the, where the dragon comes alive. The kids were great. They laughed, they applauded at the end. They asked good questions. And we had a wonderful discussion about folklore and folk tales and how you tell and, and all those good things. And I went away feeling really good about that session. I went down the hall, I took off my visitor badge. I said goodbye to the secretaries that I was on my way. It was the next day when our daughter Leanne and my wife Veronese and I were in the car, we were headed towards the hardware store, and I had just gotten there to the parking lot, I was just pulling in, and I saw this red light flashing behind me. Well, I hurried and I pulled into the parking spot, but that red light with the policeman came and parked right behind me, wedging me in. I couldn't move frontwards or backwards. I, I thought that was kind of strange, but even stranger was when he got out of his car, he came over and he tapped on my window. I rolled down the window and he said, Mr. Strader, you need to come with me. You're under suspect. Under suspect? For what? I can't tell you right now. You just have to come with me. That's all that matters. You, you can just drive behind me in, in your car. Well, I couldn't imagine what what I had done. All of a sudden, my, my throat was beginning to be really dry. My, my heart began to pump inside my, my chest, and, and my hands were all clammy. And I, I looked over, and my daughter looked at me and said, Dad, what did you do? <laughs> I don't know, I said. But my wife had this funny look on her face, and well, I followed in my car. I followed the, the police, and he drove right back to the elementary school where I told stories the day before. When we got there, he got out of his car, he motioned for me to come, and I walked up, up a very large flight of concrete steps to the front of the school. He opened the door, and we walked down the hall very slowly to the principal's office. 
It had been a long time since I had been summoned to the principal's <laughs> office. Now, the principal was a nice guy. He was a young fella. He, he smiled. He shook my hand. He welcomed me to the school. And then he said, Mr. Strader, we've got a real situation here. It seems that yesterday, just as you were leaving the school after telling stories in Andrew's class, my fifth graders were on the playground having their recess. And they said that there was this light-colored van that came and parked along the chain-link fence. And then he kind of went by, and almost as if he was stalking them. And then he got out of his car. He had gray hair and a beard. And he started snapping pictures of those kids on the playground. That's against the law, Mr. Strader. Well, yes, I'm an educator. I, I know the rules about taking pictures of kids without their parents' permission, but, but I didn't do it. The um, evidence would say otherwise, says the principal. We checked the visitor's log when you left yesterday, and, and it was just at the time that this happened in the playground. We have a situation here. But I... I I, I didn't do it, I said. I didn't even have my camera with me. Well, we talked back and forth, and finally the policeman and the principal went to another room, and they conferred, and all the time they were gone. In my head, I was saying, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. But, of course, I just stood there and looked stupid. <sighs> when they came back, the policeman said, Okay, Mr. Strader. We're going to let you go home to your daughter's house tonight, but you're not to leave this community until this thing is taken care of. Is that understood? Well, I understood, but I really didn't understand. I, I went home that night. I paced the floor back and forth and back and forth. I went to bed, but I did not sleep. I twisted and turned and turned and twisted. My head was just swimming. I, I just could not sleep. I was a nervous wreck. The next morning, about nine o'clock, there was a knock on the door, and I looked and I could see through the glass it was the policeman that I had encountered the day before. Immediately, there was this big knock that welded up in my stomach. I, I was all queasy. I, I went and I opened the door, and the policeman said, we found the guy that took the pictures, Mr. Strader. You did? Yeah, my, my partner and I, we were cruising around the school this morning as the kids were coming on the playground, and we noticed this light-colored man, just like yours. He pulled along the chain link fence there, and then he looked and finally started to get out. He had gray hair and a beard, and he had a camera around his neck. We apprehended him, of course, and, and he confessed that it was he that took the pictures yesterday. You're off the hook, Mr. Strader. Off the hook? <laughs> well, I, I may have been off the hook, but that situation was not off my mind. We go back to Bridgewater, Virginia, often to see our daughter and her family. And every time we go, I have to pass right by that little elementary school. And when we do, my hands start to tingle and my throat closes up. And what would happen if I were summoned to the principal's office a second time? <laughs> whatsoever if he was going to do this tonight. He, when we, he came into the audition room and started talking, he instantly hit me like somebody that just was meant to be on stage. Like they just, it was going to happen whether it was here or somewhere, he was going to be on stage. And I'm bringing him out this time, but I get the feeling we're going to see him a lot more. He's an incredible talent, a great person. I don't like him.
Ladies and gentlemen, the year was 1985. Denver, Colorado, at the airport. Beautiful day. Stunning, in fact. I remember this day so well. I was at the airport on my way to Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. I remember getting on that plane, everyone on board, sitting by the window seat. Nice, distinguished gentleman sitting right next to me. We take off, and if you've ever been to Denver, you know the beautiful mountain sides. Just, just magnificent. I can remember just looking out there, how beautiful those Rocky Mountains are. Almost want to make me sing Rocky Mountain High. <laughs> As we're on our way there, weather's still really nice, strike up a nice conversation with this gentleman that's next to me. Yes, you do. Just general conversations. How's the family? Where are you going? What are you doing? Things that you normally do in the airport before you get tired. Somehow or another, we end up talking about religion. This nice, distinguished gentleman says to me, so are you a believer? I said, believer in what? <laughs> you know. No, I don't know. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. That's kind of a kind of catchy subject there. But yes, I do. You believe in Jesus Christ? Absolutely, I do. But how long have you been a Christian? Yeah, I've been around ever since I've been a kid. Those general conversations, gone to church every Sunday, Sunday school. It's outstanding. It's very nice. The pilot comes on the uh, intercom. He says, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be approaching Dallas Fort Worth pretty soon. A little bumpy weather ahead. I want you to fasten up. No problem. Been flying a lot. All over the place. Flying along, we still having this conversation. He gets a little bit more deeper. By this time, I'm like, ah, okay, I'm done talking now. <laughs> Just as I said that to him, the plane's like, boom! Oh! <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of a roller coaster ride, wasn't it? If you guys been in an airplane before, you understand what I'm talking about. Those air pockets. I wasn't too concerned. I'm used to riding roller coasters. I'm a young man. I'm still a young man. <laughs> <laughs> We're riding the wrong. The pilot says again, fasten up. It's going to get a little bit more bumpy up there. We'll probably, as soon as he said that, Okay, so I kind of gaze out my window there, sitting on the right hand side there, look over on the wings. The weather doesn't look like Denver anymore. Matter of fact, I don't know what it looks like, because it's so dark that I can almost reach out and touch the darkness. I what happened to the sunshine? Wow. No problem. Done this before. The pilot says, we're coming into a landing here. Just a few minutes. I really need you to buckle up. Said, okay, now you said this about three or four times. <laughs> and you know how those airline stewardess, they come down. They're checking. I'm starting to put my seatbelt on really tight now. <laughs> like, wow. And I look over again. 
Now I can't see anything. It's pitch black. Hmm. The gentleman sitting to the left of me in the outer seat, I can almost just see him right now today. Very distinguished looking guy. And he's humming a song. Sweet hour of prayer. I'm like, what a time to be singing this guy. What's what's going on? You know, there's a time for everything. There's a time and place for everything. I said, okay, that's unique. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming in for a landing. Buckle up. It's four times now. I look over once more time and I can just, I can't see anything, but every now and then I can see a flash of light down at the bottom because you know you're coming in for a landing. It's really, really dark. Brace, brace, brace. Brace, brace, brace. Oh my goodness. Next thing I know, we're landing. Hold on, everyone. Hold on, everyone. We're going to go up around again. I said, don't go back up around again. Stay down there. We have to go back up again. And they're going up. I go, oh, my God. What in the world is going on? Don't take off again. We're down. Why go back up? The distinguished gentleman to my left of me said, are you okay? No, I'm not okay. We just landed in the middle of the ravine. And we're on the grass. We're not on the, the runway. What are you concerned about? I thought you said you're a believer. I don't want to hear that right now, but I want to hear it get back on the ground. We're saved. So we take back off again and we go back around. I'm like, oh, man. One side, I can see Dallas. The other side, I can see darkness. And I'm in between. And I got a guy singing next to me, sweet hour of prayer. <laughs> ah! The pilot comes back in again. He finally lands. Thank you, Jesus. Yes! We made it! We pull up to the docking area. And I reach over to say, wow, that was an experience, wasn't it? When I reached over to say that, the guy wasn't there. Where did he go? I said, okay, no problem. He stuck out to the bathroom when we were driving up. I'm going to say, boy, that was interesting. So we're packing, everyone's getting ready to get off, and we're going in our rows, I'm by the wing seat. And I asked the stewardess, hey, where did that guy that went, that was sitting next to me go? You know, did he, I thought we couldn't move while we were sitting out. You know what he tell you when we're taxiing? Stay in your seat until then. She said, Mr. Hyde, there was no one next to you. <laughs> I looked at her like, yeah, right. I just spoke to this guy for two hours here, and he's singing Sweet Hour of Prayer. I won't forget this guy. I know what he looks like. Did you see him? And she looks at me again. She says, Mr. Hyatt, there was no one next to you. I said, you must be crazy. No, she said, uh, the guy behind me. Sir, was there someone sitting next to him? Because this was a full flight except for the seat next to him. No, there was no one next to him. Am I going crazy here? Did the darkness get in my brain? Was it a reflection? No one was there next to me. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, I had an experience with an angel. Or either I was really crazy. I choose to believe I was next to an angel because I don't want to be crazy. <laughs> August the 2nd, flight 191, Delta 152 on the airline. Coming that same way, there was a tornado, just as it was with me, didn't know it. 
And if you've ever been on a flight and you hit those crosswinds, the plane doesn't always land like this. Sometimes it lands like this, but the wheels are facing this way. Flight 191, Delta Airline, 152 souls on the plane. Only 28 made it out of that, a flight that I took all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say believe in something, when someone asks me now, I truly try to believe in what I say. Thank you. She has done hiring, she has done a, just a, a bunch of stuff. This kind, nice, truly wonderful individual has also done the firing. And when I found that out, it kind of scared me because she's so nice. And I don't think of her as the person that would be the firing. You're going to absolutely love her. She is amazing. She's great. And to be honest, I'm a little scared of her still. Um, Lorna LaBelle. Thank you. Have you kissed your dog today? I have lavished so many kisses on my beautiful golden retrievers. Bailey and Hurley. I never had children, so indeed these two sweet, spoiled children are my babies. Now Bailey, she's a very um, energetic dog, to say the least. She's a 70-pound, light golden retriever. When I got her, she was eight weeks old. Her fur was the color of Bailey's Irish cream. <laughs> Hence her name, Bailey. Curly, on the other hand, was older, and I rescued him when he was about two. Oh, he's a hefty, hundred pound, laid man. Curly Golden. All the two of them have such great times together. They love running around the living room, jumping on each other, flipping over, flipping back. Oh, it's really fun to watch them. They also love celebrating their birthday. We pretend that they were both born on April 15th, Pack Day. I put a nice little pointed party out on both of them. They slurp up the Frosty Paws ice cream and gobble up the dog bone shaped cakes. Of course, you can't have a birthday party without. Presents, that's right. Well, of course they get presents. Dog chews, rawhide chews, knuckle bones, stuffed animals. Oh, they are marvelous at opening those things. Mm. Yes, indeed. Mm. Well, one night, a cold, bitter December night, I took them downstairs and let them out. It was so cold that even though they had these fur coats on, they were ready to come in in 15 minutes. Well, I opened the door and unlashed Bailey, or Hurley first. He got up and lumbered toward the stairs. So happy. Then I unhooked Bailey. As I said, she's very energetic. But that particular night, 
I couldn't believe her. She ran around and around the family room, bumping into the tables, ramming into the futon, and bouncing off in the other furniture. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what was going on. And then she collapsed. I went over to her. I was shocked, stunned, terrified. I knew she was dying. Oh, my God, I couldn't face it. I knelt down, and as I said, she continued this. She had seven more episodes. Oh, my gosh, you know, I knew she needed medical attention, but, you know, our vet was closed. So I called, and they had a message that in Kalamazoo, there was a 24-hour dog hospital or pet hospital. So I called this friend of mine, and she came over right away, loaded Bailey and me into the car. Of course, by now, I was just delirious. I was sobbing and praying and hoping that we would get there before she died. In addition to that, she had four more episodes. Would we make it? Oh, I was afraid we wouldn't. When we got to the hospital, the vet and attendant quickly came out and took her to the back examining area. For an hour, I paced, I fidgeted, I sobbed, I prayed, please, please let her live, please let them find out what's wrong with her. Finally, the vet came out and said that she'd been having seizures. I'd never heard of a dog having seizures. People, yes, but a dog? He said she was resting, and then I could pick her up the next day. Well, by the time we got back to Marshall, it was probably 2.30 in the morning. I was totally spent and collapsed in bed. The next day, I went to pick her up, and the vet met with me again. He reiterated the fact that she had had seizures, but they could be managed with phenobarbital and that I should see my local vet. That night, uh, Hurley sprawled out in his big doggy bed. Bailey hopped up into bed with me and put her head on my pillow. Life was good again. Roger Harris, a noted animal rights activist, once said, you cannot, cannot make dogs your whole life, but dogs can make your life full. I am full. Thank you. <laughs> Marshall Lambert has made a career of doing the one thing that all sane people avoid, <laughs> working with teenagers. Um, <laughs> She is truly a fan fairy favorite. She is an awesome performer and an awesome person to bring out. And if you keep it quiet, we're, we're trying to hook her in to get her to do even more because we just cannot get enough of her. Marsha Lambert. Thank you. I became addicted to the whole idea of traveling to exotic places at quite a young age. I read books, listened to stories, and was lucky enough growing up to get to do a little bit of traveling. When I finished college and was hired at Marshall Middle School, 
there was the chance to share that enthusiasm with students through books and with my wonderful cohort, Dick Strader, through stories from all around the world, like the Anansi and the Dragon stories he mentioned. I continued to travel whenever I had the chance, and after a summer where we had done an archaeology dig in Scotland on ancient standing stones, I came back all fired up about teaching research skills with an archaeology basis, and Lorna, my principal, helped me actually build a cardboard standing stone that we used for quite a few years after that. So when a dear friend, Abby Albright, came to me and suggested that we perhaps take students overseas, I could not resist the idea. We pulled together a group who were interested, and we began training. We worked with the kids on how to be a good traveler, don't be an ugly American, here's how we manage money, here's how we take responsibility for learning about culture and taking care of our passports and plane tickets and all those lovely things. The trip to Greece was fabulous. I mean, aside from some lost luggage and seasickness, it, it really, really went well. And the next summer, we chose another location and took another group. And the summer after that, we had another wonderful experience. And at that point, I thought it was finally time to take a huge risk. I talked my husband, who is not always a real enthusiastic traveler, into joining us. And after talking about how smooth and wonderful these trips had been, he, he somewhat reluctantly, but he did agree. We landed in Ireland with our group, and we, we divvied up the kids, and the boys that were assigned to me seemed to be quite nice. Of course, everybody the first few days is jet-lagged. We all duly kissed the Blarney Stone, and we went around the Ring of Kerry, and the night before we were to take the ferry across the Irish Sea, we gathered the kids together, and gave them their directions for the next day. Make sure you pack tonight. We're gonna to have an early morning. Some of you have chosen to take care of your own passports. That's fine, but keep it in a secure place because you're gonna need it to get off the ferry. Those of you who chose to have us take care of your passports, come and see us once we get on the boat and we'll hand them all out. It was our first non-jet lagged early night. And I went back to our room to connect with my husband, who was happily reading in peace and quiet, and he kind of gave me that, that look, that special gleam you sometimes get from your spouse. So I pulled out my travel pajamas. Oh, they were the best pajamas. They were silk, paisley. They packed away to nothing. They were soft and comfortable, and they were bulky enough to be modest in case a kid came knocking in the middle of the night needing something. <laughs> he looked at me, and I think he even said something foolish like, alone at last. <laughs> and it was then that there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and there stood one of our young boys, who to this day I remember is the scariest kid we ever traveled with. He didn't look scary. You know, he was only about this tall, skinny, as only a middle school kid who has just completed a growing spurt can be. And he had that somewhat scattered, disoriented look that a lot of kids have after a major growing spurt. I was still getting to know him, and, and I noticed that unlike a lot of the other kids, he didn't get caught up looking for souvenirs or gifts to take home. This boy was into food. Anytime we could not find him right with the group where he was supposed to be, I'd already learned, look for the nearest place that sold food, and that's where I would find this boy. So there he was at my door, and he then said the words that strike terror into every chaperone's heart. Mrs. Lambert, I can't find my passport. Well, he'd been so responsible with his money that I really thought he could handle this. So any thought of romance was, was gone. Um, we marched together through the halls of the, the hotel. It was one of those old Dublin hotels with the winding quarters. I did not even stop to put on shoes. So barefoot in my paisley silk pajamas, we marched down to the boys' room. We headed in, and the high school student from another group who was sharing space with our boys took one look at me, pulled the covers up to his neck, and kind of whimpered. <laughs> I'm still not sure if it was the sight of a pajama-clad woman in his room, or if it was the look on my face, and it could have been either or both. But at any rate, we dove into the day bag of my, my nice young man. No passport. 
We pulled out the duffel bag that he was using as his main piece of luggage, and we began to pull out every single item in there. We checked all the pockets. We found an absolutely horrendous amount of candy and snack food inside that duffel bag, but there was no passport. I crawled under the bed to look. I flapped the sheets, and out of frustration, I picked up the duffel bag one more time and shook it upside down as hard as I could, hoping to shake something loose. And it was then that I saw on the bottom of the duffel bag, there was an outside zipper compartment. I slid it open, and there inside was that beautiful navy blue gleam of an American passport. I pulled it out and noticed that there was something else in the compartment. It was his plane ticket home that he didn't realize as of yet he had mislaid. So I looked at him and said, I take it you want me to now take charge of this passport and plane ticket. And he gave me that, that somewhat distracted look and said, no, no, I think I've got it. <laughs> A second stab of fear went through my heart because I realized he really didn't understand what kind of a mess we'd almost gotten ourselves into here. I looked around. There had to be some way to, to really impress on him that this was important. And when I looked down at the floor and saw the scattered candy, it hit me. I looked him in the eyes and said, do you realize what would have happened if we hadn't found this? We'd have been stuck here for another night and you would have had to pay for two hotel rooms. We'd have had to rebook our ferry tickets and you'd have had to pay for that. We'd have had to catch up with the rest of the group, and you'd have had to pay for that. You would not have had any money left for any more snacks or candy. <laughs> Suddenly, that look of fear came across his face. By the time we had him repacked and I headed back to my room that night, I, I knew that there was no romance in my future that night, but as I walked, barefoot in my paisley silk pajamas, through the winding halls of the old Dublin Hotel, I had clutched in my hot little fingers one passport and one plane ticket home. <laughs> finished her audition with us, we all started chatting and we started talking about all the things that we were feeling, all the things we were thinking about, and all the different ways that she could fit in the show and all the, it was just all a buzz in the room. And we were just going at it, just having a great conversation. And we kind of forgot to do one thing, which was let her know she was in the show. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's us. Your next teller, Lori Tupper. I lay on the steel framed gurney. The room was dark, except for the monitor at the head of the gurney where a technician was scanning and marking my right breast. A nurse was at the foot of the gurney ready to assist if she was needed. I lay there and a chill went through my body. I wasn't sure if it was because I was naked from the waist up or the anticipation of what was to come. As the technician finished, the three of us waited quietly for the doctor. Good morning, everyone. She came in on a cloud of confidence and rode it all the way to the side of the gurney. She looked at my chart. She said, your name is Lori Tupper. You were born 71059. Today, we are going to do two biopsies on you. One on your right breast, one on your right lymph nodes. Are you okay with that? Well, I wouldn't say I'm really okay with it. <laughs> Miss Tupper, you need to realize I take this very seriously. Really? She doesn't think I'm taking this seriously? <laughs> Can't she tell from the circles under my eyes? that I was up half the night playing out every possible scenario if I had breast cancer? Can't she feel from my racing pulse that this might not be the most exciting day of my life? 
Can't she tell from the tremors of uncertainty and insecurity in my voice that I am really scared? I take this really seriously too, doctor, but I don't feel like I have a choice. You always have a choice. Really? Okay, my choice is not to have breast cancer then. My choice is to get off this gurney, put on my shirt, walk out the door with my husband, and be the person I thought I was a week ago. This is the procedure that has been recommended, and I give you my full permission to do it. Okay, then let's get started. 45 minutes later, the doctor and the technician exit the room, leaving Katie and me alone with my thoughts. I lay there quietly. Are you okay, Lori? Katie asked. Oh yes, I'm fine, I said, mustering the courage and the fine acting that I could to say it. The next thing I know, I am sobbing uncontrollably. Katie rubs my back. It's overwhelming, isn't it? Yes, it is. It was two days later, at 9.39 a.m. that we got the call. The doctor's office called to let me know that yes, indeed, I did have malignant invasive car ductal carcinoma. Tears snaked down my cheeks as I looked at my husband of 40 years across the table and listened to what they were saying. The treatment would be extensive and aggressive. And then our eyes met my husband's and mine. And suddenly I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, I would fight, I would win. My name is Lori Tupper. I was born on 71059. I have breast cancer and I am not okay with that. Thank you. I'd wait for like an intro for this and it feels really awkward. I'm gonna deliver it, but I just want you to know this moment for me is just a weird, this is the weirdest segue I have ever written in the history of ever. And I just want us all to appreciate that moment. Here we go. Wives are scary. <laughs> I don't know what the when you think about it, the wives are they they're just they're they're scary. They they the way they do things. Uh, you can be scared of snakes, you can be scared of heights, you can be scared of just about anything, but you would fist fight a cobra and risk it bit rather than making a wife unhappy. <laughs> Joseph Kunitzer, um, but the first time I heard them, I was like, man, I've got to get this guy on the stage. I love the story he told, it was exciting, it was just, it was a wonderful story, and we talked about it, and he was like, mm, no, no, I don't think so. And I was heartbroken. And then he went home, and he showed up in the audition room. I don't know what happened. I haven't asked him. I just know some piece of magic put him in play to be able to join us this evening, and I am very pleased that, that happened that way. Coming to the stage now, we have Joseph Kuminser. By the time I got to Athens, I was getting sick of Europe. I was bored. But to explain that, put that in a little context, I had to tell you about when I was 12. I was pretty depressed. 
I thought I was worthless. I thought I was a waste of space, and everyone, including myself, would be a lot better if I just wasn't around. I mean, Jesus taught us that we should love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus taught us that the greatest love we could give would be to lay down our lives for our friends. But if my life is worthless, if I have no friends, how am I going to do that? So I made a bet with myself that maybe uh, I, if I lasted long enough, if I found someone, if I found someone that I could help out in my life, maybe that would be a good thing to do. But if I got to maybe 35 years old and I hadn't done anything yet, then well, I, I will have lost the bet. <coughs> so after university, after college, I went traveling through Europe looking for answers. Went to museums, went to hostels, talked to a lot of different people, and even saw the Sistine Chapel. But seeing the Sistine Chapel while hungover is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so I got to Athens, and I decided I was going to fly to Tel Aviv, fly to Jerusalem, fly to Ben Gurion Airport. So I did the research and bought my ticket and showed up at the airport. Now, when you fly to Israel, you don't go up to the ticket counter, they come to you. And stands kind of like that one right there. And they came out to me and I got in line in one of those little stands and they said, oh, and where are you going? Um, I'm going to Israel. And you're alone and you're by yourself? Yes. And your last name is Kunitzer? Yes, my last name is Kunitzer. All right, well, right this way. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. So over the, the course of the next four hours, they asked me, uh, about what was my intention. It's like, well, I hear it's an interesting place, and I'm, I'd like to go. I'd like to find out about Israel. And eventually they let me go. And I got on the plane, and as we were arriving in Ben Gurion Airport, I could hear the Hebrew playing in the, in the music, and the people started applauding, and I knew I was in a very interesting place. Now, in a hostel in Tel Aviv, uh, I thought about going to a kibbutz, kibbutz which is an Israeli commune, but they wanted a three months commitment and I was pretty impatient. So in a newspaper article, I saw that they, there was an organization called the International Solidarity Movement, the ISM. Now that rang a bell. A couple of years before, a young woman named Rachel Corey had died trying to protect a Palestinian house from being demolished. And that sounded like something worthwhile that I could join, a group of international observers going over to the West Bank of Palestine. So I took a bus to Jerusalem, and 48 hours later, I walked into Bethlehem with my backpack. Now I was nervous. An American walking into Israeli, walking into Arab territory while the United States was occupying Iraq. The first thing we did was we did a nonviolence training. And then I went to the second biggest city in the West Bank, which is called Nablus. From Nablus, we went out into the countryside, and I joined several families going to help harvest their olives. Now, we would go out into the day, uh, and we were not allowed to eat food at that time because it was in the middle of Ramadan. Now, I did sneak some uh, sips of water from my camelback as a 20-something backpacker but they didn't seem to mind that. Now what we would do with the olives is we would put a skirt out underneath the tree and we would go up and hit the olives with a stick and the olives would come down and we would gather them. And I can remember one woman, her kids have already left home and she's wearing a black hijab and she said to me, thank you so much for coming through a translator. She said, thank you. Heaven has sent you. Allah Akbar, she said. And I learned in that moment that Allah Akbar, praise God, is not just said by radical Islamists. <laughs> Later on, when we were at a refugee camp, a group of us international observers heard that there was a tank that was entering into the village. Now we went out to meet this tank and, you know, use our passports, use our rights as Western citizens and the threat of bad PR to 
observe, to bear witness to what was going on. Now, when we got out to the city square, or what was the city square at the time, there were boys out there, scrawny, dirty, skinny, malnourished Palestinian boys with rocks. Now, their main goal was to hit the rocks on the tanks as much as they could and impress their friends. They also had buckets of paint, and that was a real big score if they could get those buckets of paint on top of those tanks. Now, we saw an opportunity to block one of the tanks from entering further into the village. So we stepped out into the road, about five of us, and we linked arms. And this tank is maybe 50 yards in front of us down the street. Well, these things are enormous. And it started, it was going at a, a fairly slow clip when we stepped out into the, into the road. But when it saw us, it hit the gas and starts roaring towards us, spewing diesel fumes. Well, one by one, we dropped our arms and stepped to the side. You know, Rachel Corey and that guy from Tiananmen Square be damned. But one person remained. And I stood there for an extra couple of seconds, looking at it, up at this tank, roaring at me. How dare it come into this village and bother these peaceful people? But I was really thinking, is this a good idea? <laughs> Is this a good investment of my life and everyone that's loved me up until now? So at the last second, like a matador to a bull, I stepped to the side and it passed in front of me, inches from my nose. Now, 14 years later, 30 odd countries later, I know when I hug my daughters, when I kiss my wife, when I see the miracle of my students learning, when I see a beautiful sunset, I'm grateful that the fear of meaninglessness helped me to step away from the front of that tank. Now, I still struggle with things that are more monotonous, doing the dishes, um, doing lesson plans, but I'm starting to realize that those two are ways that we can lay down our lives for our friends. I haven't spent near enough time with our next teller, Mary Beth Mank, to feel as connected to her or her story as I do. I, it's just that the, her story feels like it needs to be told. It needs to be told on this stage, it needs to be told like on the radio and like on TV and movies and books. It just needs to be told. It, it's meant to be heard. And I'm so happy she's here to do that, to tell us that tonight. Mary Beth. My mother died 40 years ago, but it took me until this past summer to stand at her grave for the very first time. Here's why. I was born in Dublin, Ireland, and spent the first year and a half of my life in an Irish orphanage before being adopted by a couple in Buffalo, New York. Three years later, my parents went back to Ireland and adopted another baby who became my adopted sister, Colleen. From time to time when I was growing up, I would say to my mother, Mommy, why did my Irish mother give me away? And my mother would say quite honestly, Honey, I don't know. Maybe she was too poor or too sick to care for you. But I will tell you this, your mother must have loved you very much and she was very brave to give you up so that daddy and I could give you a better life than she could. And that answer satisfied me for many years until about 1984. By then I was a teacher working on Long Island and I had a little boy in my class whose parents were from Ireland. And when they heard my story, they said to me, we have an attorney friend in Dublin who could help you find your mother. 
which is how it came to be that I was soon on the phone with Sister Gabrielle, who worked at the orphanage, St. Patrick's Guild, where I had been placed. On the phone, she said to me that she was looking at my records. She had my mother's name in front of her, which she would not tell me. She said, your father's name is not in evidence here. Your mother is dead. But your mother's sister, your Aunt Alice, who was there when you were born, is still alive. And if you would like to contact her, you need to send correspondence to me. I will forward it on to her, and it will be up to your Aunt Alice to contact you. So I put together a beautiful letter with some photographs and sent it off and never heard a word. Fast forward to 1997. That was a very important year for me because a seminal book was published titled Banished Babies. It was written by an investigative reporter named Mike Malate who broke wide open the story of Ireland's secret baby export business. It told the story of how the Catholic Church, specifically the Irish nuns, worked deliberately and systematically to try to rid Ireland of any baby born to a mother who was not married. In order to do this, to have these girls give up their babies, they shamed them and shunned them, enslaved them, and in some cases, even tortured them. And these young women had no choice but to give their babies up, whether they wanted to or not. The book also said that Irish orphanages often lied to adoptees trying to find their parents, telling them that their parents were dead when they knew full well they weren't. In 1997, my life was very busy. I had two young children, a very busy freelance writing business. I had a husband and a home, and what I didn't have was time to reopen my search. Fast forward to 2011. By now, the landscape of my life looked quite different. I was divorced. I owned my own home on Long Island. My little children were now young adults. And I had reunited with my high school sweetheart, Paul May, who was living in Battle Creek. And for many years, Paul and I were enjoying a long distance relationship. The other thing that happened by then was that my sister had found her mother, Kathleen. And Kathleen told my sister that for six months she tried desperately to keep her. But she couldn't get a job. No one would rent her a flat. No one would help her. And so with a broken heart, she gave her baby up to the nuns at that point in time. And she said that the whole thing was so devastating that she never got married, never had any more children, and never forgot Colleen, even for a day. Kathleen said to my sister, have Mary Beth try again. Ireland is different now. And so I sent an email off. And a couple days later, I got a phone call. Hello, Mary Beth. This is your cousin, Taddy, from Dublin. <laughs> your mother was me godmother. Unfortunately, your mother has passed. But you have a big Irish family over here, Mary Beth. When are you going to come and meet us? So I told Paul about this, who was in Battle Creek while I'm on Long Island, and he said, you have to go. But I was a victim of the recession, and I said, Paul, I don't have the money to go to Ireland. He said, I'll take you, sweetheart. And I said, well, thank you, but I'd really like to go when I can take my two kids. He said, I'll take them too. And so off we went to Ireland. And we stayed with my cousin Terry and his lovely wife, Marie. They had a big family reunion for me. And my family, my mother's family, knew my father's family. 
And my cousin Dermot and his wife Anne had another big reunion for my father's side of the family. I learned there were seven siblings at my mother's generational level. All had passed but one. My Aunt Ethel, who was 90 years old. But as it turned out, it was Ethel, not Alice, who was there when I was born. So I got to meet Aunt Ethel, and I said to her, Aunt Ethel, did my mother tell me she loved me before she gave me away? And my Aunt Ethel said, your mother never saw you. She turned her head. And I said, well, I know she must have been very brave. And she said, your mother was terrified. So on the plane home, I now had a heart full of love for all of my Irish relatives and a better understanding of what my mother went through. And once I got back on Long Island, I had some of my own challenges. I went through bankruptcy and lost my home to foreclosure. And Paul said to me, sweetheart, come and live with me. So he rented me a moving van and moved me lock, stock, and barrel to Battle Creek. But I wasn't even here a year before my beautiful Paul was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. 18 months later, Paul passed. The day after he passed, my Irish relatives were reaching out with invitations. Terry and Marie said, come. Terry's brother Martin and his wife Mary, who I met one time, said come. Aunt Ethel's son and his partner Penny, who I'd never met, said come and visit, stay with us. Let us take care of you. But I was in no shape to get on a plane after Paul passed. It took me another year and a half before I could collect myself to get there. And I went there this summer and again felt enveloped by my Irish family's love. Terry said to me, Madam Beth, I did a bit of research on your mother. I found a grave. Would you like to go visit it? No pressure. Now, I don't believe our loved ones are in the grave. I believe they live on, but I don't believe they're in the grave. But out of love and respect for Terry, I said, OK, Terry, I'll go and see my mother's grave. And when I stood in front of my mother's grave, I was oddly moved, and I began to cry. And Terry just simply slipped his arm around me. He said nothing, but the gesture meant everything. And I thought to myself, maybe my Paul and my Irish mother together helped to bring me back to the loving embrace of my Irish family. I mean, it makes sense because my mother and Paul and I all know searing loss, the loss of a baby, the loss of a beloved sweetheart and husband, and the anticipation of the loss of your own life. But we three also know deep and profound love. And of the two, loss and love, love is the strongest. Loss, that's just temporary. But love, love, my friends, that is the never-ending story. Thank you. Based upon the amount of preparation that Linda Power did to uh, join us today, I, I honestly believe that hidden somewhere in her outfit, she has a Swiss Army knife, <laughs> a microphone just in case one of her ear goes out, a small portable generator to generate enough power to put the microphone, all the sound system, and the cameras, and somewhere out there, I, I believe a substitute MC, just in case something happens to me, which we can be guaranteed is going to happen because I just gave her that intro. Um, if I don't return, I will miss you all, and it's been fun. Coming up to the stage now, we have Linda Powers. October 13th, 2005. Most of you won't remember that day, but for me, it was an extraordinary day. And I woke up feeling as such, but I didn't know why. 
The day started out as a beautiful, crisp fall morning. There were still plenty of leaves on the trees, and they were exhibiting their full fall beauty. The air was crisp, it was clean, but it was cold. And the sky, it was a magnificent shade of blue. And so, just like every other day, I got myself up and ready. I loaded up my beloved S10 Chevy Blazer and headed down the road for work. Now, let me tell you about this Blazer because I love my little Blazer. It was the first vehicle I had ever owned that had a CD player in it, and I really thought I was something with that <laughs> CD player. Ironically, it was the same magnificent shade of blue the sky was that day. And just to the right of the steering wheel, there was a push button to engage the four-wheel drive. Now, this button wasn't any bigger than a button on your shirt, but every time I pressed that button, a little red light lit up, and I always felt extra bulletproof when that light was on and I needed it to be. And so driving down the road that morning, enjoying that beautiful fall morning, my cell phone rang. It was my mother. I thought, how unusual, because my mother doesn't normally call me this early in the day. So I took that call. Now, I was enjoying talking to my mother, taking that normal route I always took to work, south on Morgan Road to west, I'm sorry, south on M66 to west on Morgan Road to south on East Avenue North. And as we were chatting, I was approaching the Penfield area, and I noticed that the sky was turning very dark, and there was now a mist in the air. That mist, over the next couple of miles and minutes, would eventually turn to rain and then sleet and very heavy snow. A little voice inside my head said, Linda, you shouldn't be out here today. I thought, where did that come from? And so I said, Mom, I'm experiencing this really heavy snow. It came from out of the blue. I think I need to just hang up and focus on driving. And so we said goodbye. By the time I got to M66 Bowling Alley, it was snowing very heavy. The snowflakes, they were as big as baseballs, and they were the wet, heavy snowflakes. You know the ones. The ones that when they hit your windshield, they go kersplat. And so I turned on my windshield wipers, and they were icing up. I also noticed that the pavement was becoming very, very icy, so I reached over and I turned on that four-wheel drive. I rounded the corner onto Morgan Road, and I really took note of the traffic. There was a Jeep behind me, but it was far enough away that I felt safe in our distance. In the opposing lane, there wasn't anything coming. A little voice inside my head said, Linda, maybe you should pull over and just wait this storm out. But instead, I continued to drive. Knowing I would soon turn to the left on East Avenue North, I wanted to let the, the Jeep owner know that I was going to turn left, and so I signaled to the left in plenty of time. As I approached that intersection at East Avenue North, that little voice inside my head once again said, Linda, maybe you should go on up to North Avenue where there's a stoplight. It may be a safer place for you to stop. Instead, I rolled into the intersection at East Avenue North, where I came to a stop. Now I looked to the left, and as many of you may know, that there's a slight hill there just before the stop sign, but I didn't see any traffic. In the opposing lane, I noticed a dump truck, and I felt that due to the road condition, it was just far too close for me to safely turn left, so I thought I'll stay right here until it passes. I looked to the right, I didn't see any traffic. The Jeep was still behind me, in fact, getting ready to come around me. It was slowing down. Again, looked to the left, and this time, I saw a black SUV, and it was moving very, very fast. As a matter of fact, it was moving so fast, I immediately and instinctively knew it wasn't going to stop. <laughs> and so that little voice inside my head said, OK, Linda, what are you going to do now? You're a sitting duck. You can't go right, there's a Jeep coming around you. You can't go left, there's a dump truck coming right at you. You better brace yourself because you're about to be broadsided. And in that moment, I saw my life flash before my eyes. I got a knot in my stomach and every muscle in my body tensed up. And it was as if time slowed down. And I watched that SUV as if I were watching a slow motion movie. It got closer and closer and closer until it hit me. And it hit me so hard, it spun me around and hit me a second time.
time. In the process, I was thrown into the driver's side window. I hit my head, ricocheted off that window, and landed in the passenger seat. Eventually, that car came to a stop. I remember picking myself up and patting myself down. I thought, okay, <laughs> you're here. All the parts are okay. But where am I? I was a little disoriented. Well, I was, in fact, facing in the opposite direction from where I was just traveling. And then a sheer fear came over me because I thought, the dump truck. Where is the dump truck? I scanned all over looking for that dump truck, but as if by the grace of God, that dump truck had simply disappeared. I don't know where it went. As a result of that car accident, I sustained a closed head injury, and it was a nasty little closed head injury. Over the next several days, weeks, and months, it was as if my mind had become a really bad cell phone signal. You know the one, the one where you're talking on your phone and all of a sudden the signal drops. It was the same thing with my thoughts as I tried to communicate them. I would simply forget them and I couldn't get them out. I couldn't get them back. And so, since then, 12 years have since passed. It's been difficult for me because of the sheer panic attacks I originally had trying to drive the car again, or worse yet, being a passenger. Today, I'm still a lousy passenger. Ask my husband, he'll tell you. <laughs> I feel as though I've regained my confidence where my driving ability is concerned. And depending upon whom you ask, I think my head injury healed okay. <laughs> But every time I get by that intersection at East Avenue North and Morgan Road, I think, Linda, you're a very lucky girl because the result of that accident could have been very different. And I learned that I have a little voice inside my head and I needed to learn to listen to it and trust in it because it was there the whole time. It was trying to tell me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to my story. And with that, I wish you safe travels. Thank you. Each time we do this mosaic storytelling thing, what we do is we create, get our storytellers together and we put them in little cohorts. And the fun part about that is that they want them to kind of gel together like a little family. It's one of the things that, at least to me, it seems like when you're out taking risks, it's a lot more fun to do it with friends and family. And this definitely can sometimes feel like a little bit of a risk. Every once in a while, one of the tellers from a previous cohort just kind of tickles our fancy and we just have to bring them back because it just makes us happy. So our next teller is one of our favorites and hopefully he's one of yours, Tom McCullough. This tale is reminiscent of classic gothic horror. It takes place in my hometown of Norwich, Connecticut in the early 1970s and pertains to an incident so sinister, so diabolical, so spine chilling, it makes most individuals tremble with fear. Be advised that the home my family and I lived in was built around 1812 and was quite haunted. Paranormal phenomena in the way of shadows, footsteps and whispers was quite common and my siblings and I would often gather together to discuss what we had seen and heard. During one of these sessions, my then 14-year-old sister Mary indicated to me that for the last several weeks, she had been experiencing some very strange phenomena in her room at night. Mary mentioned to me that she would hear the slight sound of faint footsteps. Then she would hear someone call her name. Mary! Mary! She would then hear what to her sounded like someone bouncing a ball. <laughs> And then most frightening, maniacal, evil laughter. 
Mary indicated to me that because of the terrors she was going through, she felt she was slowly losing her mind. <laughs> <coughs> For the next three months, my sister Mary complained to me about her night horrors. She had lost a lot of sleep, had lost weight, and just plain didn't look well. She indicated to me that she was in fact on the edge of madness. <laughs> I was not able to discover the cause of her problems. My sister Mary was at the point of madness, and the cause of her trouble was none other than her then seven-year-old brother, Jim. <laughs> yes, Jim would rise from his bed just after the stroke of midnight, down this baby blue bathroom, used the bathroom in the hall, then back light slipped into his sister Mary's room to begin his deviltry. <laughs> Jim would slither into a big easy chair in Mary's room, wrap his arm, the navy bathroom around his face, and begin his torment. <laughs> He would whisper with a hissing, serpent-like tone. When Mary would awaken, Jim would quietly lurk in the dark shadow, the easy chair, eyes glaring at his victim, unseen and unheard, until his sister eased off again into restless slumber. Jim would then pick up ball out of the pocket of his bathrobe and bounce it once, twice, <laughs> thrice, then catch it! But before his sister was fully awake, when she had dozed off again, he would torture his sister with impish, evil laughter. <laughs> <laughs> when Jim was reasonably sure that his sister had fully asleep, he would fly off to his bedroom just before the sun rose. <laughs> Friends, we often hear about the pros and cons of television, but I tell you, my brother Jim was influenced by an afternoon television program and that he used the ideas he learned from that program to drive his 14-year-old sister to the point of madness. <laughs> In the late 1960s, the early 1970s, television featured a unique gothic soap opera called Dark Shadows. Some of you may remember it. <laughs> this program, Dark Shadows, featured a suave character named Barnabas Collins, who by some strange twist of fate was cursed to be a predator of the night in the form of a vampire. This character, Barnabas Collins, greatly influenced my brother and his friends, who, while dressed in navy blue bathrobes and armed with two-inch plastic fangs, rampaged the small neighborhood of Thamesville in Norwich, Connecticut, in which they lived. No one was safe. <laughs> now Jim's role, of Nosferatu, that is, the undead, was to come to a very abrupt end. <laughs> One night, I heard my brother get up from his bed, walk to the bathroom in the hall, and close the door. However, when the door opened again, the light remained on, and I did not hear Jim go back to his room. A short while later, I heard my sister Mary cry out, So, it was you! It was you all this time! I'll kill you! You are really going to get an airport! <laughs> because Jim had forgotten to shut off the bathroom light, <laughs> his imagined cloak of invisibility was useless! Jim's body was silhouetted 
as he walked into Mary's room and she could see him perform his antics. Now Jim realized he would bear the full brunt of Mary's wrath. I heard the identical pattern of Jim running down the hall, trying to escape his fate in the sanctuary of his room with his sister lumbering after him, yelling to the top of the lungs, her vows to punish her evil little brother for his diabolical torments. My parents heard the commotions in the downstairs bedroom and ran upstairs to see what the emergency was. They arrived just in time to prevent my sister Mary from actually trying to drive a wooden stake through the heart of her younger brother. <laughs> when the sun rose the next morning, all traces of the vampire had vanished in the trash, <laughs> never to return. This tale is seldom told by my family members. <laughs> it has been put in our, the far recesses of our collective unconscious. For it concerns a time when my brother Jim stalked the night as a vampire and perhaps should only be talked about in small whispers and maybe shouldn't be talked about ever again. Who knows what evil lurks in the heart of younger brothers? <laughs> I know. It's a storyteller. I started picking up people in the audience because it's fun to tell stories and now these folks have to come up with a great story of what uh, I was talking about considering I have no idea when some people's birthday ever and I don't think whoever Rhonda is actually was a gymnast but if you're sitting next to Rhonda ask her about it it'll be great um, we have snacks and punch and things out the back at, in the area behind us and so we invite you to stick around and trade stories talk with the tellers that's part of this experience it's one of the best part of the experience is for the tellers to actually get to meet you guys and to have conversation after so we would love for you to stick around um, for this to work, we, it all comes together because of the work of our organizers, our mentors, and our tellers. Uh, the, our final teller for the evening, Nicole Mullis, is all three. She is a, a, uh, a truly wonderful individual that I am so pleased to be able to spend every Thursday for every month with. <laughs> it is uh, a pleasure by far. I give to you our final fellow this evening, my little sister, yeah. Nicole Mullis. <laughs> And the only way my family could afford it is if we took them through the Girl Scouts. So every year I did the bare minimum necessary to be considered a Girl Scout in good standings and keep my pool privileges. And one year this required me to go horseback riding. Now, unlike most grade school girls, I do not dream of owning my own horse one day. Horses terrified me. All four-legged creatures terrified me. Probably because the only four-legged creatures I saw on a regular basis in my Detroit neighborhood were very territorial dogs. We lived between two of them. There was Bacchus, the ferocious Rottweiler on one side, and Wally, the equally ferocious Border Collie on the other side. And whenever my siblings and I went out to the yard, they would bark and snarl and jump up on the chain link fence and all you could see were claws and teeth and the idea that I would get on the back of something 10 times the size of that Rottweiler and ride it around was laughable. But I wanted my pool privileges, so I went. 
And I remember they took us to the barn and the trail master explained to us how human beings control horses. And he showed us this metal bit that would go in the horse's mouth. And depending on how we pulled on the reins, the horse would go left or right or stop. And then he warned us, never let go of the reins. Never let your feet come out of the stirrups. And then he started putting Girl Scouts on top of horses. <laughs> I was the last Girl Scout to be put on a horse because I wasn't spending any more time up there than I legally had to. And I will never forget the feeling of this giant beast shifting its weight underneath me while I sat up there clutching the reins, keeping my feet in the stirrups, trying not to breathe. So the trail master started leading the horses out of the barn, and they all went, except mine. He was just standing there, and I was on top, frozen, clutching my reins with my feet in the stirrups. So the trail master came back and said, just kick it in the side a couple times with your heels. And I was like, I'm not doing that. So he came in the barn and sweated the horse in the rump, and it took up. My heart was in my throat. And I'm, he's following the other horses, and I'm like, I'm not going to make it. Well, fortunately, my horse was no more interested in going on that trail ride than I was. And as soon as the last horse disappeared in the woods, mine stopped, dropped his head, and started eating. <laughs> now, at first, I was still terrified because I was alone on my horse nightmare, clutching reins and holding my feet in the stirrups. But the longer he ate, the more I thought, maybe this horse will keep eating. If I'm still enough, the other horses will come back, we'll join them going back into the barn, and nobody will know I didn't go on this trail ride. I'll get my badge, keep my full privileges, it's all good. And it looked to be working out. He kept eating, and I started to relax. Started looking at the trees and the clouds, and the rain started to be slack in my hands, and my feet kind of slipped out of the stirrups. And that's when I heard the screaming. And coming at me from the woods fast was this horse. And what looked to be a rag doll just bouncing on top of it. And before I could register that that was a Girl Scout, and she was the one screaming, my horse picked up his head and took off. Now, I wasn't holding the reins, and my feet weren't in the stirrups. So in a hot second, I was hanging off the side of the horse, stuntman style, with my hands gripped into the saddle. Now they say, when you're faced with death, time slows down. And I think that's true, because I remember looking at the ground and picking the mud puddle I was going to aim for when I let go. And I let go. Splash. Five seconds later, splash. The screaming Girl Scout was right next to me. We got up and walked without saying anything to the barn, where we found out that we weren't the only Girl Scouts to have little trouble with our horses that day. And what would later be described as spring fever, all the horses sort of lost it on the trail ride and started fucking Girl Scouts left and right, <laughs> resulting in two concussions and one broken arm. We were lucky. But I remember when my Girl Scout leader dropped me off at my house, and I'm walking up the driveway, wet, bruised, cold, Bacchus going nuts on one side of me, Wally going nuts on the other side of me, that this thought occurred to me. No pool privileges are worth this. <laughs> so happy to hear to I think the colors, all the colors for this evening, can't get you guys to slide on up here real quick. As they're making their way up, I just want to remind you that we are meeting behind there, and so you're welcome to join us. If you would like to get an email or a communication regarding upcoming events, there's a pad of paper on the desk that you will have your ticket on. You can go ahead and sign your, put your information there, and we will send you out the information that lets you know all of our events as they come forward. Why am I in the middle? <laughs> I'm, 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 I am not the star. That is, the, the stars are in front of me, and you guys are amazing. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out. Have a wonderful evening.
What's going on? <laughs> Access Vision, your voice, your community.